All right, well, let us begin. Uh, my name is uh, Sunil Prasad. I'm one of the PhD students here in the Stanford Religious Studies Department. And I just want to officially welcome everyone to the first of five Potomac mini lectures uh, for this academic year. The Potomac series showcases senior as well as exceptional junior faculty. Yet instead of delivering a traditional research presentation, we've asked participants that come to use the classroom lecture as their model uh, instead. We've budgeted exactly one hour for this event. And most importantly, I wanna quickly bring your attention to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And I'm asking you to please take advantage of it. Uh, my, colleague, my colleague in the program, uh, who oversees the Pitarian series, Anu Jamin, will make an appearance at the end of the lecture to field our questions and present them uh, to our speaker. And now for this evening's program, I, we are extremely privileged to have Professor Nicola Denzi Lewis, who holds the Margot Goldsmith Chair in Women's Studies at Claremont Graduate University. She is the author of numerous books, including one of my personal favorites, The Bone Gatherers, The Lost Worlds of Early Christian Women, as well as a more recent work, The Early Modern Invention of Late Antique Rome. In addition to the many awards and recognition of her outstanding contributions to the field, she's also made numerous appearances in media outlets such as National Geographic, The History Channel, CNN, and NBC. Tonight, she will be speaking to us all about Roman catacombs. Uh, and with that, uh, I thank you for your time, Nicola, and I pass the virtual microphone on to you. Thank you so much, Sunny, for the introduction and to Michael for the opportunity to speak to you all today. It's delightful to be here. I'm going to share my screen. Give me one second. All right. We good? Hope we're good. Everybody can see that. So we're going to start over in Rome, south of the city, on a lovely late November afternoon along the Via Appia, the major ancient thoroughfare in and out of the city. Along an avenue of cypresses on any nice day, joggers and cyclists like this one thread their way up and down a path. Like, what's this? In recent years, these signs have sprung up, announcing that things like jogging are not allowed, for these are sacred sites, ancient Roman Christian catacombs underneath. And soon you come upon a gated area like this, with inside it many people waiting for their underground tours. So what are these catacombs all about? Catacombs, first of all, are vast underground burial sites dating back to the third and fourth centuries of the Common Era. They're not unique to Rome, but Rome has some of the largest and best preserved complexes in the Mediterranean basin, all of them outside the city walls. Dug from Rome's soft volcanic soil, they extend for miles underground and can be up to five levels deep. They contain the bodies of as many as 1.5 million dead. And for 20 years, perhaps perversely, they have been the, the, the special focus of my academic work. So of the 60 or so catacombs around the city of Rome that we know of, only five are open to the public. These are popular tourist sites receiving upwards of about 400,000 people every year, but they're not neutral windows on the past. As tourist sites, they're carefully curated to tell a story about how the past came to be. Now, this is not exclusive to tourist catacombs. Of course, it's true of every archaeological site open to the public and every museum. But I want to talk today about the things that the catacombs can teach us about the past and a little bit about what they can't teach us about the ancient past. They're invaluable resources, but we have to work with them carefully. Before we can get to what we learned from the catacombs, I want to emphasize the point that I just made. As they appear to us today, Rome's catacombs are not neutral data sets where we can trust what we see, hear, and read in order to recover the past. <clears throat> so I'm gonna give you kind of a pro tip. If you go to Rome and you wanna see a catacomb, I'm gonna tell you some secret stuff about them that you won't hear from any tourist guides. Now, because this is supposed to be 
uh, a brief and accessible lecture. I thought I'd, I'd give it sort of the, the BuzzFeed treatment like if I were doing this lecture um, for um, uh, an undergraduate class. So here we go. I kind of set it up here as 10 things you didn't know about the Roman catacombs and which official guides will absolutely not tell you. So I'm gonna start with this list, my BuzzFeed list, and we're gonna work backwards as befits a, a proper BuzzFeed list. So I'm gonna start with number 10. Number 10, these were not underground cities used to hide Christians during times of persecution. Now, if you go on a catacomb tour today, the guides are quick to tell you that the idea of Christians hiding out to avoid persecution by the Roman authorities never happened. That's a, it was a quickly dispelled myth and something that they're very quick to tell you all the time. Still, numerous times I've heard the story of the fish symbol. So I don't know if you've heard the story of the fish symbol, but some of you might recognize this fish that you see on bumper stickers, you know, all across the United States. And the fish story goes like this. Back in ancient times, before uh, Christianity was legalized, Christians would uh, need a secret sign in order to be able to identify themselves. So this was the secret sign. They would have the symbol of the fish. Uh, the word in Greek for fish is, this, uh, is the acronym for, uh, for Jesus Christ, God, um, Son of God, Savior. And uh, they would identify one another down in the catacombs by putting one of the lines of the fish symbol, and then somebody else would come along and put the other line, and they would know that that was a safe space. Well, this isn't true. It didn't happen. I'm not sure where the story came from, but again, it's it's just one of those things I want to kind of knock out quickly because you hear a lot about um, this whole idea that these were um, um, spaces where Christians could meet and feel safe, even though the catacomb guides say it didn't really happen that way. Now, how do we know it didn't happen that way? <clears throat> Well, there's a lot of reasons. For one, the Christians were never actively persecuted in the city of Rome, so there was no need for them to hide. Also, these catacombs are very large sites, right? The biggest ones have entrances which were on the major thoroughfares leading out of the city, very close to imperial guard posts there on the Via Appia. It would be a little bit like having the entrance to your secret meeting place um, on Fifth Avenue in New York City, directly across from the Trump Tower, right? It, it was a, a dumb place if you wanted to hide. Finally, though, another reason that doesn't get talked about very much is that we can't underestimate really how, um, how nasty catacombs were in antiquity. When we see them now as tourists, they've been emptied out, they've been cleaned out, they've been made accessible, they've been made friendly, they've been wired with lighting, um, and most of the detritus inside them have been removed. So we don't see them as they were in antiquity. They contained mass graves, um, here is a, a mass pit grave from the catacombs of Peter and Marcellinus, um, and it's still there. This one dates from mm, second century, it's a little earlier than, um, than the rest of the catacombs. And it, as you can see, it was an open pit at the time. Uh, they must have reeked. They were unpleasant places. They were dug out. The bodies were deposited. They were closed up in there, and then they were often kind of filled up, backfill so that they could keep digging. So the idea that they were even used for visitation, let alone for Christian getting together, but for visitation to go and visit your family dead is a myth, didn't happen. All right, next, number nine. They're almost um, completely unrelated to the catacombs of Paris. So many people have asked me whether the Roman catacombs are the same thing as the Paris catacombs. They're not. To begin with, the Paris catacombs, which you can see a nice picture of them here, are not ancient. So they're developed in the 18th century to cope with the overflow of bodies in local Parisian churchyards. These churchyards by the 18th century had become so saturated with bodies that actually the soil in them no longer had the ability to break down corpses. So someone came up with the idea of depositing the bones and skeletons that were literally poking up out of the ground or washing into the streets during heavy rains into a system of quarry tunnels that ran under the city. And a century later, a mine inspector by the name of Louis-Étienne Ricard de Thierry hit upon this idea of arranging the bones by type and literally developing the site for thanatourism. So I'll show you a nice cartoon. This one's from 1822. 
uh, and you see a little bit of, um, you know, somebody's got a skull on a stick there and is kind of jumping around the corner uh, and spooking people. Um, uh, they were really intended to be spooky sites. They were intended for people to go down and kind of gawp at these bones. Um, tickets for things like chamber music ensembles, which played down there, were hot commodities in the 19th century. They're still used that way today. Of course, they're major tourist sites. You can go down. I had a student at Brown um, whose family rented them out for her 18th birthday party. Right? Um, so the Roman catacombs, by contrast, had their origins in the third century. They are ancient. And their first use for something like tourism actually happened in the 19th century. Uh, through the endeavors of this man here, this is Giovanni Battista di Rossi. He's kind of the big bad wolf um, in um, <laughs> two of my books. I'm a little bit fascinated by De Rossi. Um, and De Rossi developed the catacombs in the 19th century, cleaned them up, um, tidied them up, brought tourists down for the first time, um, not for thanatourism exactly, but really as kind of pilgrimage sites for the graves and the martyrs. So the only real connection between the, the catacombs of Paris and the catacombs of Rome is that Napoleon apparently promoted the Parisian catacombs as a tourist draw to rival that of Rome. So he was a little bit jealous that Rome had these catacombs. Number eight, catacombs represent an innovation in burial culture, not driven by religion, but by necessity. Okay. So there's this idea out there that um, catacombs are Christian and that Christians for various reasons needed a different place uh, to be buried. It could either be because of they were persecuted and uh, it could be because they had a greater sense of community cohesion such that they all wanted to be buried in the same place. Or uh, people surmise that this maybe came about because the, the Christians are um, inhuming their dead, burying their dead, they're moving away in the empire from the practice of cremation. And because of this, they need more burial space. Well, none of these things end up being true. The innovation in uh, burial culture did not have anything to do with Christians or religion. The catacombs didn't spring up because Christians wanted their own burial spaces. In fact, burial, according to religious um, affiliation, was unknown in Rome at the time. So rather by the third century, what happened is that the above ground territories outside the city wall that were used for burial were full, kind of like the situation in Paris um, 1500 years later. So rather than going farther out, right, away from the city core, where it made it difficult for people to go and transport bodies and so on, they went down, and they just dug down. The first catacombs had their origin in reused industrial spaces, so quarries and cisterns, and people started using these because they were cheap and they were convenient spots to deposit bodies. Because Rome's volcanic soil is light and strong, it's a little bit like pumice, um, uh, it's perfect for subterranean tunneling, made digging relatively um, easy. And these industrial spaces could then be easily extended as needed, right? Moving under property lines, for instance, for miles and then downwards as uh, much as needed. So catacombs, therefore, met very specific needs and avoided other sorts of problems, such as land ownership, right? They had nothing what to do, whatsoever to do with religion. So I'm just showing you this is the plan of um, the largest catacomb, Calixtus of um, Divia Appia as well. And the heart of the catacomb is actually here, this complex here. It was originally just like two tunnels um, in the end of the second century, beginning of the third century. Um, and as you can see, then it just grew. These things just, you can keep pushing outwards um, indefinitely, as long as you have um, diggers working there and they're really kind of dug to order. So um, they could expand and expand and expand without anything really stopping them until they came to, um, you know, rocks or rivers or some other thing that was going to um, imperil the structure. Another interesting fact, number seven about the catacombs, there are almost no infants 
buried in that. So, okay, uh, this is weird and no one ever talks about it. Um, so we assume that catacombs were cemeteries for everyone, right? Men, women, children. But in fact, only about 1.3% of all of the graves are to children under the age of a year. So this is strange because infant mortality could be as high as 40% at the time. In third century Rome, one third of live born infants were dead by the age of one and one half by the age of five. So where are all the babies? And that really remains a mystery. We don't know, but apparently they're not in the catacombs. Recent excavations in France of Roman houses uh, discovered numerous neonate and infant skeletons buried under the floor, in the roofs, uh, or in the walls of Roman villas. So depositing your infant babies, your deceased babies, in the house with you seems to have been a thing that Romans did for a very long time. More disturbingly, maybe, uh, excavations in both Buckinghamshire, UK, and Ashkelon, Israel, <laughs> very far apart, have revealed um, an abundance of neonate skeletons in the drains of Roman bath complexes. Uh, here at Ashkelon, they found over a hundred uh, Roman neonate skeletons. Uh, none of these babies had lived longer than one week. And all uh, apparently from the testing as well were discovered to be healthy. So um, one interesting thing is that as the empire Christianized, right? So, um, these catacombs are third, fourth century where you really have sort of the Christianity taking off and there, there was not a shift in the way that parents dealt with their deceased children. There's not, we don't suddenly find Christians burying their babies in catacombs um, with the rest of the family, didn't happen. Interesting thing, number six. <clears throat> so despite the name Christian catacombs, right? Not just Christians were buried there. Now, if you go on a catacomb tour uh, in Rome today, many guides will insist that only Christians are down there. They usually preface their tours with a little lecture on the Christian art and symbolism. It's really part of your paid tour. Um, this one I kind of stole from Google today. Um, as you can see, people are all mass in this, so it's recent. I have some from a, a few years back um, in the same little room um, at the catacombs of Callistus, Callisto. And uh, the catacomb guy there at the front is giving his seated audience before they go down into the catacombs a lesson on Christian symbolism and Christian iconography. So the guide kind of tells them, um, primes the pump, so to speak, for thinking of all this um, complex and all the burials as being Christian. And he tells them, the guides tell you to look out for Christian symbols when you're down there. And in fact, they're hard to miss because they've been taken and placed at eye level in the galleries when you go down and the guides will stop you and point to these symbols like the key row or the dove or the anchor um, or the fish and say, look, you know, this is amazing. Here, this is why we can see that these are really Christian sites. Now, the problem with this really is, well, it's twofold. <clears throat> the first is that um, the guides are presenting Christian symbols um, on graves as if they were labels that kind of said, hello, I'm a Christian, um, because they had a key row, say, on the tomb closure. <clears throat> um, maybe, but I think it's probably really unwise to consider um, a symbol to be a, a um, absolutely slam dunk sign of religious affiliation. Um, we don't know that. We don't know who was responsible for, say, putting the key row on the catacomb tomb closure. Um, it could have been somebody who had uh, instructions to do so or a vested interest in do, doing so. Um, they could be putting it on there as an apotropaic symbol, something that would repel the demons or the evil spirits, which were thought to be lurking down in subterranean spaces. So it's not that it's a Christian symbol, it's that it's a powerful symbol, right? Um, there are all kinds of reasons why we can't necessarily see a symbol, a religious symbol, as a label. So the other thing that's important to remember is that only about 10% of catacomb graves, and that's 
fairly a pretty, a pretty high number, it depends on the catacomb, um, had any sort of marking on them at all. So most of these graves were closed but were unmarked in any way. And I think it's wrong to assume that those bodies out there who are buried, who don't have any markings on their graves at all, identified as Christians. It, they may have, they may not have, we don't have that data. And I think it's unfair to make that assumption about them. There are other things that are really kind of complicated a bit about this formulation as well. So for instance, this is a, a very famous um, uh, tombstone, it's not from the catacombs, at least I don't think it is, um, uh, known as the tombstone of Lysenia Amias. It's probably maybe second century, so a little early for the catacombs. Um, and it's now in uh, the Museo Nazionale di Terme, uh, just outside Termini Station in Rome, if you want to go see it. It's a very nice epigraphy collection there. So this is a kind of justifiably famous because it's the first time, the earliest that we find in Rome, um, a Christian symbol on a tombstone. And here you see, you've got the anchor, the Christian symbol, and you've got the fish. And we see this symbol replicated as well in, in later graves in the catacombs. Not only that, but we also have above it, a sort of a, a kind of smoking gun, as it were, with the Greek formulation, ichthus zonton, the living fish, or the fish of the living, depending how you read it. Um, the rest of the stone, Lysinia and her name, and Bene Marente, this is two of the well-deserving um, Lysinia Amias, uh, is written in Latin. So it's bilingual stone. And we think that the most of the early Christians in the city of Rome were actually fluent in Greek. So, this is a fairly good indication that if this person was Christian. But wait, the kind of confusing thing about it is that above your uh, ichthus, you have a DM superscription. Now, DM, if you've studied anything about Roman tombstones, stands for Dis Maribus, um, and that is sacred to the manes, to the spirits of the dead or the gods of the dead. And it's very standard. Uh, on non-Christian, non-Jewish graves in Roman antiquity to put dis manibus at the top of your tombstone. It indicates essentially um, that this is a pagan grave. So here we have uh, a, a clearly pagan symbol and a clearly Christian symbol all together on the same stone. What does this mean? We don't know. We can make all kinds of stories up to explain um, the fact that there are these two religious affiliations in there, um, but they're all stories that we make up. They're all hypotheses. In truth, we don't know what Lysinia Amias' relationship to either Judaism or Christianity or pa paganism was. We can't tell from this stump. So provocative, but we do really have to be careful about saying this is a Christian stone. Here's another case. So. Um, one catacomb was discovered in 1955, so really very recently, off Via Latina, and I will show you more from this recently, has really spectacular tomb paintings in it. Now, this is a small catacomb. Uh, it has about 300 burials in it, so um, get the sense of uh, its smallness. It's from the middle of the fourth century, around 354, we think. And it's gorgeously painted, and it has all kinds of of scenes in it. So here, oh, you kind of testing out your knowledge of early Christian art. You can take a guess. Um, here is Jesus uh, at the well of, with the Samaritan woman. Jesus, by the way, in early Christian art, this is very often the way you find him portrayed. He doesn't yet have a beard until really the fifth century we start finding <clears throat> bearded Christs. Um, but in the early Christian art, he's always a young beardless man. So here we have, we have a nice Christian scene from uh, the New Testament, the Gospel of John. And uh, further down the hall, we have this. This is another like test question for you here, if you know your early Christian art. Or, um, this is uh, just guess. This is Noah uh, in his ark. Uh, and I always love the ark in early Christian art because it's always a box like this. It's never really a boat. Why? Because Noah and his ark becomes a type um, uh, for baptism. And so the ark 
is actually not really a box, but really a baptistry. And, uh, and that's sort of Noah in the ark foreshadows uh, the baptism of Christ and therefore baptism as a sacrament. So you have the scene here from the Hebrew Bible, right? Down the hole from that, we find this grave. Uh, it's an Arcosolium grave, an arch grave. And at the back of it, this beautiful painting here. And in 1955, when they saw it, uh, people were like, wow, why is that thing? They figured for a while it was Cleopatra. Uh, and um, after a while, we figured, no, no, it wasn't Cleopatra. Nice guess, though. And it's actually the Roman goddess of the earth, Tellus. So, you have in one catacomb complex scenes from the Old Testament uh, or the Hebrew Bible, Christian scenes, and a scene of a pagan goddess. Here is the last, last two cubicula in the particular complex of so the catacombs of Via Latina. I have written a lot about this. There's two chapters of my first book, The Bone Gatherers, uh, that discuss this particular room has always fascinated me and you can see how beautiful it is it's really um it's small but it's just gorgeously painted everything is covered every surface is covered and it's quite an exclusive place we had um one or two people uh, a couple here on the other side of the room there's also one or two people we don't know because the bones are gone and at the very last chamber here, there was a very old one person, a young girl. And if you look at this, we have Hercules here <clears throat> on this image. We have the goddess Demeter here uh, on this. And we have Daniel in the lion's den over here. And here, we, these are sort of Christian symbols. We've got a peacock in the back, which is a symbol of resurrection. And here, this you can't see it very well but this is um, Jesus and the miracle at Cana. So this is really interesting, right? What was the religious affiliation of the people who were buried in this catacomb? You certainly can't say they were absolutely Christian, although that argument had been made early on uh, and it was figured that all the, the pagan imagery in there in fact signified, um, it was purely symbolic or it was meant to be seen as Christ. So Hercules is really a type of Christ and you look at Hercules and you think Christ. I think that's a ridiculous argument, um, and most people do now. But the point is that religious affiliation was a, a, a complex and personal thing in antiquity in the third and fourth centuries. And we could only, again, speculate about what it is that people believed. But we have to really be careful using these as any kind of a label. I also want to talk quickly about Jewish burials, because I talked about Christian and pagan ones in there, but I haven't said anything about Jewish burials. Um, it, it has been widely said that there were no Jewish burials in the Christian catacombs. This is patently false. Um, it is certainly not true. Um, one, <laughs> there's all kinds of ways that we actually know this for sure, but I'll show you this nice piece of um, gold glass. Gold glass is a fourth century Roman phenomenon. They're the bottom of drinking vessels that were at some point broken, maybe ritually, we don't know why or how. Uh, and then the bottoms of the glasses were embedded into tomb closures, into the mortar, and used decoratively. Um, and then later they get kind of hacked out and, and then end up in museums because they're pretty pieces and so on. So here's a piece of Jewish gold glass. Uh, Jewish gold glass makes up only a very small percentage of all the gold glass that we have in the city of Rome. And you can see here, it's a very nice example. This one's from the Met uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. You've got a shofar down here, you have two menavot, uh, you have an Aron Kodesh, you have the, the Torah Ark over here um, with the Torah scrolls that you can still see inside the Ark. So um, very clearly Jewish imagery. It comes from a Christian catacomb. In fact, every single piece of our Jewish gold glass from the catacombs comes back from Christian catacombs and not from the Jewish catacombs. Um, a little known fact and something that is re never really advertised and something you don't hear from the guts, but is um, yeah, uncontrovertibly true. Which brings me to the next point. That's number five. Jewish catacombs are an early 
modern Roman myths. So if you go to Rome today, you may find out that there are Jewish catacombs. And it sounds like a really controversial thing to say, Jewish catacombs are an early modern Roman myth. And it is pretty controversial, but I will balance that out by saying that Christian catacombs, I have just already explained, are also an early modern, uh, Roman, early modern Roman myth, right? Um, that there is no such thing as a purely Christian catacomb. In the same way, there was no such thing as a purely Jewish catacomb. All right. So we have as many as uh, six ancient Jewish catacombs that were identified from the uh, 19th century all around the city's periphery. Of those, only two remain today. And of those two, only one is accessible. That's the catacombs of Vigna Randonini down there in the south. Um, it's directly across the street from the Vatican administered catacombs of San Sebastiano, which isn't labeled as such here, but it um, contains the Basilica of uh, Peter and Paul. So that's uh, Sebastiano. Grab it Now this catacomb, the Vigna Randonini, has an amazing fine story. And for it, I'm really indebted to um, the work of Jessica Della Russo from the International Catacomb Society, and she's writing her dissertation on ancient Jewish tomb types. So thank you, Jessica, for, for uh, all the research that you've done on this. Um, it's a really fascinating story how this catacomb gets kind of discovered and promoted, uh, but to make a long story short, the person, um, Rondanini, Count Rondanini, on whose land this catacomb was discovered in the 19th century, um, tried to sell it to the Catholic Church like his lucky neighbor across the street, right, at the lands where San Sebastiano is. Um, that person sold his vineyard and the, the Vatican moved in and they did all these excavations in the 19th century and promotion and um, uh, he was able to sell his land and make a lot of money. So um, Count Rondanini tried to do a similar thing. Um, could he sell this as well if they were going to go down there and excavate it and so on? Um, but the church wasn't interested. Why? Because when they send an emissary down there to take a look, as soon as you go into the complex, there's a cubiculum and above the cubiculum, that's a little tomb chamber, um, was a menorah. And so because there was a menorah on the wall, they said, well, this is not a Christian site, there are no Christian martyrs here, um, and they refused to buy it. So the landowner was um, pissed, excuse me, and he uh, kind of did a fire sale. He just kind of got rid of all the antiquities, all the things that were originally in this catacomb. And then he ended up sort of clearing it out. And over time, it sort of became um, a, a counter site for pilgrims and Fano tourists who came down the Via Appia and wanted to see the Christian uh, site of San Sebastiano or the, um, the Memoria Apostolorum to Peter and Paul there. And on the other side of the street, they could go and pay some money and go down and see a Jewish catacomb. And they wrote about these in the 19th century. We have a lot of British writers talking about them. Um, and it's kind of awful to read because they're saying, um, it's so shocking to see um, how miserable and drab these Jewish catacombs are compared to the Christian ones, which are full of light and hope. So there was a lot of really disturbing um, anti-Semitic stuff that sort of came up. Um, the sites end up, uh, the site ends up being a kind of rehabilitated by the Jewish community in Rome. A lot of the catacomb, um, a lot of the inscriptions that we had gathered outside in the Lateran's collection ended up being repatriated, being put back in this catacomb. We don't know that they were from this catacomb originally, but being put in this catacomb and mounted on the wall in order to make sort of a, a Jewish catacomb site uh, that is then traced back to the ancient Jewish catacomb, the ancient Jewish community in Rome. So it's very much a curated site in order to give an impression of an ancient Jewish community that had a, a lot more coherence to it in myth than it probably did in reality, where uh, isotopic analysis have shown us that Jews and Christians lived in the same neighborhoods, freely intermingled. Uh, there was no separation of, um, of Jews and Christians at the time. And that too, the idea that Jews kept to themselves and at their own burial sites, um, it comes from a really pernicious kind of um, Christian anti-Semitism, which is based 
on the establishment of the Jewish ghetto in Rome in 1555. These discoveries, these catacombs were, were first discovered, not the Randonini, but other ones uh, in around 1594. At that point, the only social model that there existed at the time for um, Jewish communities is one of isolation. So when they go into a catacomb and they see a menorah on the wall, they figure that the entire site had to be Jewish because that's the only way that they could conceive of um, Jewish community as again, a whole kind of collected confined community together. But that doesn't match what we know about um, Jews and Christians living together in the city uh, of Roman antiquity. All right. Next. Oh, I want to show you this about Vigno Rondanini. So this is also kind of interesting. You can go into uh, Vigno Rondanini now for special tours if you arrange it beforehand and you can go and see um, uh, the site. It's quite a, an interesting one. It's a fairly small one. And at the end of it, the very last set of, um, of chambers that you see is this double cubiculum. And um, it's beautifully painted all the way around. This is not the way that it looks like. This is this um, 3D image rendering, which is kind of interesting because you're seeing it from the outside instead of as you would see it on the inside, which is a little freaky for me, um, as if the walls were transparent. But one thing it's not so clear, you can kind of see in here if you look closely, is that there's absolutely no identifiably Jewish um, uh, iconography in this. So here you have this, this Jewish catacomb that contains um, tomb chambers that don't look to be Jewish at all. That doesn't mean that there weren't Jewish people buried in it, but it does mean, again, that you can't count on religious symbolism as being a label for religious affiliation, my earlier point. Point number four, new catacombs are often still uh, discovered today in Rome, and I think this is kind of cool. So this the lands around the city of Rome uh, itself are really giant cemeteries, so it's no surprise that new catacombs are discovered all the time. Um, a white Volkswagen discovered this catacomb. Um, it, it, at least six cars that discovered this catacomb. Um, uh, a cat discovered one that's back in, in 2012, you see. Um, now, why is it significant, right? It's not surprising, right, given the, uh, the high percentage of funereal lands outside the city. Why it's significant? Because all five of the catacomb sites that are presently open to the public are um, operated as Christian shrines by the Vatican. And while the Vatican's Pontifical Commission on Sacred Archaeology oversees all excavations of newly discovered catacombs, they're a lot less beholden today to the early modern Catholic sentiments and ideologies that drove the Vatican archeologists of the 16th and the 19th century. So uh, these sites, when you find them are pristine, they haven't been cleaned up and tidied up. They haven't had their bones taken out, they haven't been swept out um, in the way that the major ones have. And uh, that makes them really fantastic archeological sites. So we know, we've learned a lot more about burial practices. Uh, we've also been able to do scientific analyses of the bones of some of these catacombs to learn other things about the human populations of them um, in a way that's not possible with the large catacomb sites because those bones, again, as a religious shrine, um, are not subject to any kind of testing. Point number three, kind of a cool thing um, you may not know. You can explore two catacombs from your couch or from your desk. Um, you don't have to go to Rome, or I shouldn't put it that way because everybody should want to go to Rome. Um, if you can't go to Rome, the Pontifical Commission has actually collaborated with Google to put two of the catacomb sites um, on Google Street View. So all you need to do is go to Google Maps and type in Catacombs of Priscilla and then hit Street View in 360 degrees here. And you can go down and you can navigate around just like you would on the streets on the surface. And it's pretty fantastic. Now this catacomb is open to the public, um, but this one um, is not. So this is the catacomb that I showed you the images of Tellus and uh, Demeter and, and Hercules and Jesus and so on, the catacombs of, of Via Latina. 
or as they're called, or better now, officially the catacombs of Via Dino Campagna. And it's a gorgeous site. It is very, very impossible to get into. I'm just going to say hard. Um, it's not even very hard. It is impossible to get into. They're very carefully guided. They're never guarded, never open to the public. It's partly because there are accessibility problems. Um, this, in order to get into it, access is from a manhole cover in the middle of a Roman street. So the street, they have to collaborate with the city officials to block off the street so you don't get run over when you come up from the catacomb. Um, and uh, have somebody take you down a ladder um, to get to the, the level of the steps and go down and see this. It's also extremely precious because of the paintings and the moisture levels. So it is so delicate that a hot breath can um, cause um, mildew to form or even for the, the fresco to crumble itself. So getting into this is nearly impossible and it's just a fantastic, fantastic resource. Uh, that Google has made this available if you want to go down and, um, you know, scroll around and go through this, um, this complex. Uh, again, what I would have given back uh, in 2005 when I was writing the Bone Gatherers and I was trying to reconstruct um, the layout of this catacomb and what images spoke to which, uh, based on only the photographs that I had without being able to do this kind of a tour and it Took me about 20 years to get um, permissions to get into this particular catacomb. So a great resource. Number two. Um, although they were once believed to contain the bones of scores of martyrs, most people buried in the catacombs weren't martyrs but were ordinary Romans. So if you read my most recent book, I hope you do, um, I start in a, a little town called Monselice, which is pretty close to Padova, and a chapel there which contains the, the bodies of martyrs taken from the Roman catacombs, including the body of St. Valentine, the Valentine, who specializes in Monselice at um, curing fevers and epilepsy. The saints at Monselice, uh, and I've got a couple of pictures in my book, are buried with uh, little vases in their hands, as you can see them here. Um, these are uh, wooden replicas of actual uh, glass vases, which were embedded in the tomb closure in the mortar around the graves where these bodies were taken from. Okay. Why is that important? Well, you see this cup says on it, vas sanguis, uh, sanguinis, which means uh, a cup of blood or a vessel of blood. And down in the corner, you actually see a reproduction of um, the epitaph here that corresponds with this body. This is the body of um, supposedly a virgin by the name of Faustina, who died when she was 21. And next to it, you see, I can't see it actually because it's blocked by my thing, but hopefully it's not for yours. There's a little picture of a little vase. So what that was is when they were going down and they were excavating these catacombs, they found that some of these tomb closures had these little glass vases in them. And once they looked in these vases, they saw that they contained a red sediment. And they surmised from this that this red sediment must have been blood, and that therefore the people who were buried in these tombs with the little vases were martyrs, and they had been buried with a little bit of their blood, and this marked the grave of a martyr. So these were the graves that were opened up, and the bodies were removed, and they were sort of put into um, uh, churches all across Europe and even into um, other places. Um, and it's kind of an interesting thing because in the 19th century, uh, de Rossi, again, who was a little more scientifically minded than his predecessors, wanted to do a little bit of analysis of this sediment. And what he discovered was that the red sediment wasn't blood at all. What it was is um, the residue of aromatics. So in other words, what we had in these um, tombs were not uh, little vases full of blood, but um, ancient air fresheners. And um, those tombs that had the little air fresheners next to them were perhaps the particularly smelly ones. Um, and it's kind of a funny thing if you think about it really that these got to be mistaken um, as the bodies of holy martyrs. Okay, nearly done here, number one. In the 16th century, uh, 
<clears throat> the catacombs first became sacred shrines, right? And the Catholic Church employed grave robbers to empty the catacombs of skeletons and bones, which were then sold across Europe and beyond becoming catacomb saints. So I kind of got into this a little bit with my description of Mont Selice. If you go to the major catacombs these days, you won't see very many bones. So guides will tell you that the tombs were opened and ransacked by the barbarians in the sack of Roman 410. This is a myth, did not happen that way. Um, uh, Alaric and uh, his Goths were not particularly interested in smashing into the graves of ordinary people. They had much easier access to better spoils inside the city. So when were the graves opened, into, uh, opened up and ransacked? In the 16th century, when the Catholic Church hired uh, a, a core of people called the Corpus Santari, uh, and their job was to remove the catacomb bones uh, so that they could be sold to the highest bidder as uh, sacred relics, and also to kind of sow Catholicism and Catholic piety outside of Rome. So that's why if you go to certain lands, particularly Switzerland or to Bavaria today, you may find some catacomb bones, um, some, uh, some skeletons that have been long removed or thousands of miles from their origin in the city of Rome, and they've been um, absolutely beautifully dressed up if somewhat macabre and put in these display cases um, uh, where you can still see them today. So I like going and seeing them, visiting them, um, honoring their Roman roots uh, and honoring the fact that these most likely were um, the bodies of very ordinary people who ended up having very extraordinary afterlives. So thank you for listening. So as always, I know we can't hear the audience members, but there is a round of applause happening somewhere out there in cyberspace. Um, first of all, this was a phenomenal presentation and I actually learned so much. Um, I think one of the biggest takeaways for those of us that study late antiquity is that from late antiquity to now, in the many hundreds of years that have passed, there's actually been a lot that has happened to the archeological record. Um, and oftentimes it's easy to kind of forget that when, when looking at material culture. Um, so on that note, I kind of did want to start on archaeology. I did have a question about the archaeological aspect of all of this. Um, with respect to catacombs, you had said that the catacombs kind of went outward and down. So mm -hmm. when we're looking at the stratigraphy of the catacombs, when we're kind of just looking at the data itself, it's kind of reverse of what we would think in archaeological terms then, right? The deeper you go, the more recent it actually is. Right. And so what kind of impact has that had on like, Set has made things more complex. I imagine it has. Like, how yeah. has that been factored in? Yeah, that's a really great question. And there hasn't been um, a lot of um, modern archaeological work that has been done on these catacombs that have been open since the 16th century. Um, the ones that we've found that are recent don't have as many layers and really aren't as large as complexes as these are. They have done a little bit of work looking at um, the progression of tomb types to try to identify, um, you know, um, dating through these tomb types, which they're able to do. Um, I agree, it's, it's completely counterintuitive. I think when you're standing there too, to think like, oh, like they go down, right? And sometimes you're very deep down and you see these graves that are 10 feet up above you and you, so it's hard to think that like, oh, you're actually um, kind of in the more recent past. Um, so other than looking at things like, um, yeah, tomb typology and the shift over time for those, there's not too much we can do in terms of, um, I don't know, distinguishing, I guess, the, the, uh, the import of these different levels. And you can also find things like coins um, embedded in there, which can, can are good archaeological um, time markers in some sense as well. Yeah, I can, I can imagine. Um, and so just to kind of continue on here, someone has asked how many total kilometers of catacombs have been uncovered? Um, oh, that's a good question. And I used to know this off the top of my head and I probably should. I know that the biggest one in Calixtus is like about 20 miles uh, of tunnels. So I think in total, it's got to be, it's well over a hundred. So I know that. Um, so just, I mean, on and on and on and on, although again, it goes on these different levels, right? So if you were to stretch it out, 
um, it, it just it really kind of goes on for an incredible amount of time. So, and, and we don't even know all of that, right? We can't even access all of this to map them out. Yeah, um, no, I, I get, I, yeah, that's, it must be many more than what we are, what we have access to right now. Mm -hmm. right now. Um, I did, we did also receive a question. When, when did they stop burying people in the catacombs? When did they stop? Yeah, when did they stop? And, and do you have a yeah. reason why or are there theories as to why? Yeah, yeah, there are lots of theories uh, as to why. Um, it, it happens generally around the fifth century and it happens for two reasons. Um, this is again the time of, of the, the collapse of the city, right? Um, in the fifth century, the population severely declines in the city of Rome. Um, and so there's just kind of less going on. And this is the time again of the barbarian invasions. The people are coming in. Um, the city walls are not holding. People are breaching the walls. And uh, they start to bury the dead inside the city walls, uh, partly because it's dangerous to go out, right? Um, and so there's a shift in that fifth century of this kind of way of thinking. And it also coincides with putting the bones in, in churchyards, uh, in, outside, burying them um, around churches inside the city walls, um, whether that's to kind of keep them safe, the people safe from um, uh, the, you know, the barbarians or from people, from enemies who are out there. That's one of the reasons there's kind of a question about um, the importance of the saints and whether they start to bring the bones of the saints from outside the catacombs into the churches in order to sacralize the churches. And then people wanna be buried next to the bones of the saints. And that's been a prevailing theory for a long time. But what our most recent work shows that actually people come in and are buried inside the city walls before the bones of the saints come in and are buried. So it's not true that it was about um, wanting to be buried close to the bodies of the saints. Okay. And so I'm now, that. That was a great, great pivoting point, I think, in terms of, of turning our attention maybe more toward the historical religious studies side of things. Um, you made this one point that I found super, super interesting that, you know, we see these Christian motifs in these tombs, but, you know, we don't really know who put them there. We don't really know why they were there. Um, and that one potential reason was that maybe they were apotropaisms, um, yeah. or, you know, or, you know, demons were kind of this, this huge concept in early Christianity and, you know, the symbol maybe was potent. I mean, what I did want to ask, you know, since during this time period, the empire had only just begun to Christianize, what evidence do we have to make the argument that these symbols actually did have power, right? How, how, you know, how are they, how do we know that they're more efficacious? Why wouldn't we see a symbol from a more longstanding tradition? Maybe, you know, a pagan symbol or a Zoroastrian symbol. Why necessarily Christian? It's a great, uh, it's a great question. And the answer, it wasn't um, just Christian. And those are the ones that get all the attention. And one of the favorite articles that I've written is actually on magic in the catacombs. Um, and in it, I, I go through a lot of the evidence for um, symbols and objects that are found in the catacombs that um, were clearly thought to be objects of power. We have um, a little bone token of a sphinx. Um, we have Egyptian figures and figurines. We have a lot of... Um, um, graffiti of things like um, gladiators or ships, um, maybe to uh, carry away the spirits of the dead. It's kind of interesting stuff. We have um, magical symbols, we have characters, um, we have stars, we have um, like swastikas. I mean, there's all kinds of, of, of symbols down there that are not just simply, you know, a key row. Um, or a, a patently Christian symbol like that. So we figured that it had, they had to have been there for apotropaic reasons because um, there's all kinds of stuff that we know about people fearing hollows, people fearing dark spaces, um, that demons clearly lived in these sorts of places. It wasn't thought to be a sanctified um, atmosphere. So we have all this. It's just not the catacomb guys don't take you down there and go, look, here's an Egyptian sphinx and it's used to protect the other. Um, they don't do it. And that's not the way that they read the, you know, something like the Kiro. So again, they read it as a label. And I'm saying, you know, maybe it was a label, but maybe they put a Kiro on there because they think, well, that's a powerful protective symbol. 
that you want to put on there um, to make sure that everybody's okay. It's kind of the same as, as lamps. There are a lot of catacomb lamps down there. Uh, and people say, oh, they need the lamp so that they can see their way around when they're going in to, to see their beloveds. Um, but no, they're not going and visiting. Um, that's not actually true. But the lamps are there because lamps are, are clearly apotropaic too. And the light is meant to ward off the demons. And we have um, texts that talk about this as well. And we have lamps that are used in magical spells. So, um, you know, it's clear that the lamps were just about giving people light so that they don't bump into walls in the catacombs. Yeah. Um... Oh, so on that point, in terms, you just mentioned texts, and someone had actually reached out and asked, um, do a number of late ancient authors, or are there any late ancient authors that explicitly mention the catacombs? What type of genre is associated with the catacombs? Who's writing about it? You know, just kind of more in the historical record, um, mm -hmm. what we see. Yeah, there's not an awful lot that's written about it. There's there's a, a few references and things like the Liber Pontificalis, which isn't, you know, it's late antique, but it, it's also sort of continuated into the, the Middle Ages. So it's not necessarily an ancient text. One of my favorites and best um, texts that talk about the catacombs is actually Jerome. And Jerome has this passage in one of his commentaries where he talks about being a schoolboy in Rome and how um, he and his pals used to go down into the catacombs as a dare. Uh, on Sundays after services. And I love this passage because um, the way that it tends to be interpreted and used, and you find it in a lot of catacomb scholarship, is like, look, see, these are sacred sites. And Jerome would go down there with his buddies like after church and he'd go visit the martyrs. But that's not what Jerome says. I mean, Jerome clearly says, these places are like the gates of hell, right? They are terrifying. And we go down, uh, you know, to scare the shit out of each other down there. Um, and uh, that's a completely different way of interpreting, right, what the catacombs represented in late antiquity than we tend to think of them like, oh, these are martyr shrines and all the pilgrims are going and it's lovely. Um, in fact, even in, you know, in the fourth century Rome, the catacombs were ruinated and people aren't going down there because they are scary. Yeah, I, it's, it's a more realistic perspective, it, it seems like it oftentimes in, in modernity when we study these things, it's so easy to kind of imagine. Um, right their imagination. But yeah, uh, oftentimes historical sources bring us back to reality. Um, okay, so we are at the last two minutes, and we do have one more question uh, from an audience member, and they specifically want to know, what do we know about the funerary workers or caretakers of these places? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, too. Um, so the, the funerary workers, the, the, the fossores, there's been a long-standing debate whether the fossores were a, a class of clergy or whether they were sort of independent brokers, right? Professional um, funeral workers who, who were down there. And the idea, I come down on the, on the side of these were professional um, workers who were not a class of clergy. Um, though not everybody agrees with me, Sarah Bond, who does fantastic work at the University of Iowa, for instance, argues clearly that they were a, a class of clergy. I think the idea that they were clergy comes from um, what's actually a misreading of uh, some of the ancient material that says that from the third century, the Catholic Church administrated all the catacombs in the city of Rome. Um, it's based on a, on a mistranslation of a, a text of Hippolytus, or pseudo Hippolytus, wasn't really Hippolytus. And um, uh, it actually says that uh, Zephyrinus uh, appointed a bishop, Calixtus, over a cemetery, and it gets translated as the cemeteries. Very different. So if you want to hold that from the third century, the church administered all the catacombs, then the fossors who we know were down there because we have images of them digging and so on, um, had to have been employees of the church. If you take away the idea that the church was administering all the catacombs in the third century, it, it goes, stands to reason that the fossors would have been um, independent brokers. I have a, a very quick story about this. Um, which I think is kind of funny anyway. The very the, the time I got into the catacombs of Via Latina that I told you about and showed you pictures of, um, I uh, had I was invited actually to go visit them from the Vatican. And um, I showed up at the site out on the street at the appointed time with a couple of my colleagues. And we tried to get down there and the, the fossor, because there are modern fossors who trace themselves back uh, genealogically to the ancient fossors, wouldn't let us down until we'd paid a significant bribe to him, cash bribe. And when we complained that we didn't have that much money with us, 
um, that it wasn't, you know, in the agreement. He said, well, I'll call him out again. And he went off on his phone and was talked. Then he came back and was like, okay, fine. They say I can let you in, but basically you have to empty your wallets and give me all the cash you have and I'll let you down, um, which is what we were forced to do. And I thought this is really probably how it worked in antiquity too. The, maybe these fossors actually were employees of the church writ large, but they're the controllers of the doors. They're the ones who will open it up to you. And, you know, there's where the independent contractor bit comes in. They may be officially employed, but you are going to pay them <laughs> that prime to get in. So that's kind of a, a funny story anyway about how we got into these things and my uh, modern analogy for how things probably worked in the funeral industry in the fourth century. Well, that's phenomenal and a crazy story. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, that's really wild. But that does bring us to the end of our time. Um, and I just wanted to say again, thank you so much for joining all of us um, and giving us this amazing lecture. It was, it was really, really cool. So appreciate it so much. Yay. Well, thank you Andrew, so much for fielding those questions. Um, and um, yeah, um, go take a look at my book. Seems tacky to give a plug for my book, but uh, there's a lot more in that one where I get to tell the stories uh, in a little bit more detail than I could now. And thank you again for the invitation to come and speak. It was great. Of course, of course. All right, everyone. Good night. <laughs>